Get ready for a no BS approach to health and fitness. This is NBS Fitness Radio. All right, welcome back to MBS Fitness Radio. I'm here with Dustin Baker. Uh, Dustin has a really uh, incredible story of fitness transformation and then how he's kind of applied that uh, to like a new trajectory of life. He's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Um, and then also his company that uh, specializes in a synthetic form of GH. I'm going to let him kind of um, really dive down deep into, into what that does and how it can help y'all. So Dustin, welcome to the, to the podcast. Um, introduce yourself and tell us kind of your story. Oh man, I appreciate you having me on first and foremost. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to tell my story and take up your time and hopefully not bore any of your listeners for the next, you know, 30 minutes to an hour too much. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, to me, my story is just a, you know, a basic type thing. I, I was, um, a, a normal guy. I mean, I grew up, uh, in a single parent household. We were, had really poor, um, when I say poor, but we realistically had zero nutritional counseling. So I grew up a very unhealthy kid, uh, overweight kid. And I say that because I see that today so much more than I did back then. And it's like, now you see so many kids that are extremely overweight, extremely unhealthy. And, and that was me. Um, I didn't have a strong male role model in my life. Um, who got helping me guide through that. I was the slow fat kid. I played right field in baseball and I got to play three, my guaranteed three innings. And that was pretty much it. So <laughs> like um, that, why I tell that story is because it, it, it snowballs right into early adulthood. And yeah. I, um, I grew out of the, the kind of the, the fat kid phase, but I was extremely unhealthy teenager, extremely unhealthy, 20 something. It goes into college, you know, drinking, drug use, partying, all that kind of nonsense. And fitness had zero, I mean, zero um, impact existence in my life. I, I may, if I had worked out for real one time, I think I had a trainer for like three months when I was like 13 because my mom felt bad, but that didn't <laughs> stick. And me, the entirety of my exercise was like skateboarding and getting into trouble and like yeah. running from the law. So that was exercise, right? Yeah. So as a 20 something with zero purpose, zero discipline, zero anything, you know, it, it, it snowballs into, like I said earlier, partying and poor decision-making, dropping out of college, et cetera. And all of those things compounding and helping, I finally had a friend who was into fitness step into my life and go, yo, Dustin, why don't you like not do that today or tomorrow? It was actually tomorrow. And why don't you come work out with me? And I had nothing better to do. I couldn't even hold a job at that point. I think I was still borrowing 40 bucks from like my dad or my mom or somebody to even pay like my Boost mobile cell phone bill. So I was like, what else do I have to do, dude? <laughs> so um, if Boost still even exists. But uh, so I did. I, I went out and worked out or worked out with him. Really basic like chest and tries workout. I ran on the treadmill a little bit. And little did I know that one workout and that kind of shift in my daily routine it really like something happened to me and it really triggered something in me. Number one, I had a ton of time on my hands. And I didn't have anything else to do. Number two, it gave me looking back now, it gave me something to work towards and it gave me some level of purpose because after that workout, it started to snowball mentally for me. And I, I had, like I said, a lot of time on my hands. So it just I learned clicked. everything I could. It just clicked in that workout. Pretty much. Yeah. Like I needed, I, and, and I, I'll develop on this, but I, I, what, what I really needed was I needed some sort of purpose yeah. and I had none. I had no yeah. purpose. And frankly, what, what, what I, when I look back, I see that working out in fitness and I'll get into this because I believe it's truly the inception point of what made me, um, the type of businessman that I am and how, you know, I've had some failures and some successes, but we've had some big successes. And I think I can tie a lot of these, these, um, similarities into success in business. The one of them being, Working out, fitness, nutrition, you can't buy it. You can't nope. steal it. You can't cheat it. You can spend extra amounts of money and maybe hire some really great coaches. That will help. That, that could speed up the ability for you to achieve your goals, not because it's going to do the work for you, but because it's, you know, accountability is a huge deal and helping individuals stay on track is, a, I mean, that's worth every dollar, right? I got coaches for stuff. I think they're, they're, there's a reason why they exist and there's a reason why, you know, certain coaches in professional sports get paid more than some of the players do. And it's, yeah. it's very important. So 
when I, when I tell that story is I look back and I see this little paradigm shift because from that point on, I changed a lot about myself. I changed, um, my eating habits completely changed, you know, alcohol consumption, um, all kinds of different, really awful things about how I was living my life really changed. And I'm not saying it was some massive, initially it was a massive change overnight, but it, those types of things still take time to develop. And I can trace back, like I just said, a lot of very successful moments in my career or how I got from A to B directly related to how I started working out and then continuing to training. That's awesome. I just still have a connection with that friend. Oh, all the time. Um, so we're a little bit distant. He lives very far away, but I, I tell that story all the time. And I like to, you know, his name is Mike. I, I uh, many, we don't talk. We probably talk like once or twice a year at best yeah. because we're, we're living different lives and different yeah. things. But I do, I, there's something of, I like to tell like my first mentor, his name's Joe. We'll probably talk about him later, but I like to send those individuals and tell them kind of the impact they've had on my life, whether they take it very seriously or not. I don't think people do that enough in life of looking back and, and saying, Hey, just so you know, you really helped me do this. Even if it's the same thing over and over again, I think people need to hear that people need to hear that they make positive impacts on people's lives. We're inundated with just awful messaging all day long from every single angle, whether it's people, the news, TV, movies, it's really not exactly a positive atmosphere in this world. And, and even just texting somebody saying, or, or this show, you know, sending him the link whenever this comes out and being like, Hey Mike, check out minute six at 37 seconds in. Yeah. And whether he listens to it or not at this point, I think he kind of knows, but at least giving them the credibility yeah. that they deserve that he made a big change in my life. He knows that. And that's important for people to know. thousand percent. And it, it probably didn't seem like that big a deal to him at the time. And kind of looking back, it's like, how are you going to know the moments that like really changed the entire trajectory of someone else's life? And, um, and that for him, I'm, I'm imagining it's, it's, he's like, man, I just asked you to come work out, but, 100%. Hopefully that that uh, that inspires other people. Like, well, invite that, give that person a call, invite that person to the gym. You know, a small act of kindness or a small act of of um, influence can truly change the the trajectory of someone. I saw I saw a meme like a couple of days ago that was very powerful. I think, and I'm not the biggest like self help guy. I don't go to seminars. I used to read like, you know, books like that years ago. And I think they're helpful and they have their place, but I, you know, I'm not the big, I don't spend $10,000 in seminars to go do this stuff. Like I'm kind of a, like a shut up, grit it, bear it, like figure it out, make it happen. But I did see a meme the other day that was similarly self help, but it was like, people always think, man, if I could go back in time and just change this one thing, I could change history forever. But they very rarely do they think, okay, cool. Well, I can change one little thing right now in existence yeah. as we speak that can change the trajectory of something way further on down the line, which you would be looking back on. And I thought that was really cool and a really great perspective to think on. And it's little things like that, that, and I'm not going out there, Mr. Pay it forward, like handing out hundred dollar bills to homeless people, videotaping it, putting it on the internet. But you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like um, it's little things you can do to help people out or just let people know that they made an impact on you. That yeah. could really, you know, brighten someone's day. And and um, people are important. You can make changes in people's lives. And, um, you know, he didn't mind in a, in a huge, huge, huge way. That's awesome. So you go and do this first workout. It, it sounds a little bit like you were, you were, you were primed and ready. You were searching for something and this just kind of yeah. fit the, the fit the lock perfectly. So like, then what happens? What happens next? So I think, and to, to, to speak on that, I think everybody's searching for something, right? Like yeah. it, everybody needs a purpose. And um, my life has changed in a lot of respects in, in a very good way where I will get um, asked questions by different individuals, whoever, whatever it is about how to change this or how to, you know, how can I change this? How can I improve this and blah, blah, blah. And I always say like scheduling, finding a purpose, finding something, even if it isn't that specific business thing or something like that, whether it's working out or whatever, finding that something you're earning and, and putting work into that you can consistently stay with because it bleeds into the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, so from that workout, I, you know, luckily the internet existed. I don't know how this would look like if it was 50 years ago before this and I would have had to do this the old school way, but the internet's full of whether good, bad, or indifferent information to learn. And the first thing I think I started learning about was food, like manipulating nutrition, um, you know, all, all different types of approaches, all 
they all lead to the same place, which is calories in, calories out and making appropriate choices, but learning how food chemistry actually works and why you need this and why you need that. I'm a big why guy. I like to understand why something is. And then that way it's easily, it's more easily acceptable by my own psyche. If I can understand the why of something and then I'm kind of locked in and that led to, you know, just working out and then learning about workouts and stuff. And it led me to the same guy, uh, got me in. Cause that would, I mean, we were at, th- at that rate, we were very, very close and we were hanging yeah. out all the time. Um, same guy got me really into performance athletics and, you know, Olympic weightlifting. And that was back in like the CrossFit days and yeah. like really like performance stuff. And I went to go work out at one of those gyms and this guy, um, this gym was a, I mean, it was a performance gym. It was run by an ex-decathlete. He trained for Beijing and Athens. And I found myself in there. And then that's where I got my real, excuse me, my real career start. Mm, okay. And I lost my job um, from whatever reason. I, you know, I got a big mouth sometimes. Um, <laughs> and I lost my job and I couldn't have paid. Back then I could, I, I worked a little bit, right? Like I, yeah. I made a couple of bucks, whatever. But it was just, you know, I was like, I was bartending, like serving tables and stuff. But yeah. um couldn't afford my gym membership, lost my job, couldn't afford the gym membership. And it was back then it was like 185 bucks. This is, you know, 10 plus years ago. That's expensive. And that was a lot of cash. Years ago, yeah. 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 And so, um, I went up to, I don't, I don't think I've ever said more than like two words to the guy. And I was like, Hey, I know you don't really know me, but I can't pay you anymore. And I don't want to lose this gym. So I'll do whatever you want. I'll clean your toilets. I'll take out your garbage. I'll do whatever. And he's like, okay, deal. And so, <laughs> Um, this is the same person, remember, like five minutes ago, who told you it was a complete degenerate who couldn't do anything. I mean, you couldn't even get me to wake up before noon. Yeah. And I was in this guy's gym working for free at 7 a.m. Yeah. And so, like, it clicked in my head. Then one day he gave me, like, a month in, he gave me, like, 250 bucks. And I was like, whoa, this guy's going to pay me. Yeah. And I was like, I can make money doing this. <laughs> and so, all bets were off. It was it took 250 bucks and all bets were off. And then I, I spent everything I could to learn from him, mentor under him. And again, I, I didn't have any strong mentors. And this guy like took me under his wing and taught me all kinds. He was like an older brother. He taught me all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, he even taught me how to weld. The story I tell a lot is, I know, and I had none of this stuff. The story I tell a lot is everybody's familiar now with air bikes, Mm -hmm. but this is the the type of guy I was working with was air bikes didn't exist back then. And what he used to do before anybody even knew what an air bike was, he would find this was in the Midwest. So people have basements and he used to find and hunt down the gold Schwinn Schwinn's. air bikes. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yes. So an air dine. Yeah. Okay? And I learned how to weld by welding. So he would program these into workouts before assault assault even existed as a company. Yeah. And so I would learn how to like nickel weld by welding wheels, big cat, like big wheels. I would go get from home Depot and building them onto bikes and then building meters, magnetized meters into the fans to then run. So they could be tracked from a, an output level. That's so like this guy was way ahead of his time for wow. all of this stuff. Wait, yeah, what he, is was, it? he still is. What was a ri- Was there a screen on the old so, one? Well, we would, so what we would, yeah, but it was like, um, it was like a, uh, uh, like a uh, wind RPM. kind of like vacuum, okay. like yeah. RPM, like, and it would yeah. jump, but it didn't measure any type of like quantifiable metric yeah. of yeah. power out, not power output. Cause it had RPM as power output, but it had, it couldn't measure distances or yeah. work output. So you couldn't really program it. Right. So you, you could buy only do like the, like, like cycling meters, the cycling. Yeah. You buy like the yeah. cycling. Like a, yeah. And like a cycling it meters. There. Right. So <laughs> we would awesome. weld, we would weld wheels. We'd, we'd re- refabricate, we reworked the bikes to well wheels so they could be rolled and moved all over the place. And then we would hook up and put cycling meters onto the bikes and the fans so we could measure the actual output and distances so they could be um, put into workouts. Man, so anyway, like, that's the guy that I, yeah, that's yeah. when like my whole that's kind awesome. of career started. It, yeah. That's cool. Um, Swin m- missed out an opportunity there. Um, a million sure. percent. I don't know what their <laughs> stock price is, but they still, they probably still sell $10,000 road bikes. So they're probably doing okay. They're, they're probably but, okay. Um, what do I know? You know, it's, you know, uh, I was talking to someone the other day, they saw a rig, you know, they, like they, they had not been in like a CrossFit style gym and they saw a rig. And I was, I was telling them like those used to not exist. Like they're, they're the first CrossFit gyms didn't have, they had like homemade rigs. 
You can't just go buy a rig. Yeah, dude. Or you got to use those <laughs> awful rigs that are standalones in Olympic weightlifting that were just yeah. I mean, death traps. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I know. I, I seen it all. But yeah, I um, it's a different world now. But yeah, that's that's where I learned. And I learned a lot about, and from him, I learned a lot about human performance and perform. And he's the type of guy that would lock himself in his office, like, and just program for a week and no, you, you know, put headphones on the building could be burning down around him and he was not to be bothered. So, um, I got to learn a ton of stuff from this guy for, for performance athletics and athletic, like he still programs for college teams and all this kind of crazy stuff. I mean, he's just a brilliant human performance mind, but I was trying to, what was your training like at that time? Uh, I mean, uh, standard CrossFit stuff, dude, a lot okay. of Olympic, a lot of Olympic lifting. And then that's right. Like I got really involved in like the CrossFit thing in 20, I think it was like 2013, okay. late 2012, 2013, something like that. And then before that it was standard bodybuilding type stuff yeah. and, um, you know, kind of melding it all together. Okay. Very cool. So you go to him with the idea of, was it more business focused or was it more yeah. like, I want to, well, be... I learned, I I want to learn about I, perform, uh, helping people f- perform better. So the performance thing was kind of innate. So like they, he would, he would teach guys to do stuff like that. I saw the business opportunity of like, okay, I, I'm not an innovator. I never have been people like think you know, I, I, I'll go on shows or something and they'll throw the word innovator and like disruptor and stuff in there. And I'm not the guy I don't create the, like, I'm not the guy trying to shut down any industry or having these, like, I'm not a scientist. I don't do that. All I do for a living is I identify opportunities and then I try and put the right people in the right spots to then take advantage of that opportunity to get that up, to get what I'm visioning that other people can't see to the masses. So with him, I mean, this guy, and he still is, I talk about him to this day. I haven't trained with him in, I mean, over 10 years, you know, 15 years almost. And so but still in my mind, I mean, all of these guys, I've been in professional athletics, I've been to the combine, I've done all these things. I've never met an individual who had the type of performance brain that this guy had. So to me, I'm like, okay, this is something, this is years ago. I'm still thinking, this is something very special. This, like, how do I get him to, because he's the guy, not me. He's the guy. How do I do that? So then I started learning everything I could about, um, you know, I've always been kind of a salesy type you know, I'm a, I'm a promoter by a uh, personality standpoint. Yeah. So I'm a, I talk, this is literally what I do for a living. So, um, my thing is like, okay, well he does. So I wanted to create, and I developed marketing plans to create how to get him everywhere, multiple facilities. How do we, how do we scale this? How do we turn that around? We didn't agree on a lot of that stuff. And that's when, you know, I had to go my own way yeah. and he's still out there. He's doing great. He's not, you know, I have no idea. I don't, I don't have the back, you know, back seat or inside seat into his business, but I'm sure they're doing fine. I still talk to people all the time. I'm sure he's doing great. So yeah. anyway, um, I had to leave and I had to move on. And what did you move on to? Uh, I took over somebody else's gym. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the, I, I did the exact same thing. I moved to, I moved back home. Um, because you can only make like 250 bucks, 500 bucks for so long. <laughs> yeah. So I moved back to Florida, which is where I am today. I, um, I'm a Tampa guy. And, um, I went back to serving tables, got to pay the bills, got to pay that cell phone bill. And two days into my first shift after moving back, I met another guy who owned another gym. And, uh, I was like, interesting. And so we, you know, just struck up conversation, whatever. And he's like, come on in tomorrow. Like, "Mm -hmm, okay. So I went into his gym. I did the same thing. I'm like, yo, who do you have to do this, 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 and this. And I know nobody does because nobody wants to do this work. Nobody's, nobody's looking for jobs cleaning toilets, dude. Yeah. So I was like, I'll clean your toilets. I'll do that. I'll do this. And that's exactly, he's like, okay, cool. That he was going to pay me a living wage. I was like done. And I ended up taking over his gym within the first six months. And I got to implement, um, basically my marketing plan. And we, man, I grew, we grew that gym. Uh, to the point, let's just say he didn't ever have to show up again unless he yeah. wanted to. And, so you, um, like you essentially just that. worked into the GM position is, is kind of what it 100%. sounds like. Yeah. hundred awesome. percent. I, um, you know, I don't have a formal education. I never have. Uh, well, I mean, I graduated high school barely, but I don't have a formal education. I, um, I just, I, I, I learn things from a application standpoint. I do what I can to pick up the right steps, policies, procedures, standard protocols from individuals who seem to at least be successful in some respect. They write books, they they post blog articles, I test and try different things. Some things work, a lot of things don't. And um, you you cut off stuff that doesn't work, you 
push your chips into further things that do work and you continue to do those things. And that's what we did. And uh, from there, I got picked up by a national franchise to do uh, to do their director of sales and marketing for a, a larger you know company and brand that was in the professional sports space and run their Tampa location and stuff like that. And um, I got a lot of eyes picked up on me from there and some investors who wanted me to do my own thing. So we created my own concept and, you know, that was a colossal failure, but it, <laughs> and now I learned this, a lot. What was the concept? Was it around? So I was always building everybody else's gyms and it was great. Yeah. And I did, I did very, I did well for myself. I did well for them. Um, but the, in, the intent and purpose was always to, as my, I do have one business partner now and he's like, it's kind of an ongoing joke. He's a little bit more from corporate America. I am not. And he always like, Dustin, you wouldn't have survived here. You're not a corporate <laughs> America type guy. And I agree. I'm not a corporate uh, America type as, guy. Um, as is true for most small business entrepreneurs. Yeah. I'm not interested. Um, I'm not interested in, in um, selling my personal freedom and stuff. I'd rather be my own slave yeah. driver and live in a basement, sleep with bugs and at least in work a hundred hours a week than and be the guy telling myself to do that and not, somebody else, right. even at half the time or whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, the concept was, so the, the, the plans that I had enacted did quite well. I, I grew every business that I came in like that did leave profitably to the point of, um, even sometimes when I left, I would be given or offered, I did not take it offered, um, substantial, substantial pieces of equity, which yeah. I just wasn't for me. It was, um, I wanted my own thing. So the concept that we created was, and I'll tell you exactly where we went wrong, but um, I am a huge believer in, and I still train like this to this day. I train and have, uh, given programs to, I'm really big into, and our company now is very large into combat sports. So yeah. professional fighting, jujitsu, stuff like that. Um, so I've actually worked with pro fighters on this type of training as well. I mean, existingly currently. And the reason being is because I believe in it so much, uh, is EMOM training every minute on the minute. Are you familiar? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Oh yeah. EMOM training is really cool. It just means starting a clock for let's just say 10 minutes. And, um, uh, you know, every minute, the, every minute that starts, you do a very specific amount of reps. Let's say it's 10 squats every minute on the minute. Cool. Minute one starts, you do 10 squats. You rest for the remainder of the minute, minute two, you do 10 squats per minute. Okay. So by the end of the 10 minutes, you've done hundred squats. Well, most people, you can trick them into doing an excessive amount of workload that they don't realize. And, and so you're going to get them to do a ton of work in a smaller amount of time. Yeah. Um, but also what you're doing is, is you're not fatiguing your central nerve. The smarter thing is what you're talking about is you're not fatiguing the central nervous system. People don't realize a lot that your muscles do get fatigued, but where a lot of injury ex happens or where things kind of fall apart is your central nervous system that tells your body how to move and you can fatigue that. And you do as well. So with EMOM training, what you're doing is you're tricking your CNS, your central nervous system, your CNS into not fatiguing, but you're getting a ton of work done within a small period of time. People don't realize how much work you can get done. And so anyway, I built an entire concept, small group training concept around just EMOM training built into an hour is actually 54 minutes, which gave six minutes of running your mouth and the fun, um, you know, uh, yeah. business -y type, franchise -y type stuff, built yeah. a beautiful facility, tons of cash. And I had, uh, this is a whole nother investment story, but you know, that was the first time I took on basically outside money to do a, um, to do a concept and an idea. Yeah. And we had the idea that we are going to do this and we are going to take on the biggest names of the game of, you know, small group training. Yeah. And, um, things are a little bit harder than they look. The concept <laughs> was great. The facility looked great, but you still need people to enter into your space and continue on. And, um, what I would say is, and this is a great lesson to learn from business was um, to never outkick your coverage. Yeah. Meaning don't spend money. You don't have to. <laughs> don't spend money. You don't have learn to build your business, whether you're a fitness entrepreneur, whether you're, you know, whether you own a janitorial company and you're an owner operate, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, play the cards you're dealt, build your business, small brick by brick, by brick, by brick. Don't think you can short, you can short circuit or circumvent the hard work and the the brick laying that needs to exist. And I'm very happy that that experience happened because yeah. um, it was very tough during the process. I mean, I lost everything in that, yeah. in that deal and that's okay. Cause it taught me more. My business partner now will say, Dustin, I'm happy that it happened in that venture for you because you basically got a Harvard MBA 
in business the hardest way possible in the shortest time frame possible. And now we take it into business now, and this business has been wildly successful. I mean, we've, yeah. we've acquired a company and taken it from a small regional company to, I mean, we've shipped to over 30 different countries and we have people providing the product from here to South Africa to, you know, everywhere in between. So it's been a, a good experience. Why do you think that concept did not take off? Um, I still think it could have taken off. In fact, there are it's there's no shortage of jokes that it could still be really great, that people still think it would be awesome. And that's that's great. Um, I, I think it didn't take off because we we didn't we didn't spend our money educating and marketing to the right individuals. We spent ego money, which is how I would put it. And I have no shame in saying I had a gigantic, massive ego back, ego back then. I wanted to be, you know, the biggest name, the biggest mouth, the biggest face in business. And um, I didn't earn any of that. I didn't deserve any of that. I didn't build, I built other people's businesses, but I used their money and I did it and I did it okay. And I did it well and I made them cash, but it's a lot easier to do it with other people's money than your own. And um um, I had a gigantic ego and I think that played a large role in it as well. Um, we just tried to skip all the hard work and yeah. you, you know, we dumped, there was a ton of cash. I went into it and you still couldn't do it. So I, um, it was just, it was misappropriated funds and that leads to shortening your runway. So if you're in the fitness yeah. business, it's all about recurring revenue streams. And if you don't have recurring revenue streams to cover your, your fixed costs, things that you cannot change, like rent, utilities, staffing, if you have it, um, your runway starts getting shorter and shorter yeah. and shorter and your plane doesn't get any faster. Yeah. hundred um, percent. All right. So you, you attempt this new kind of Iman fitness concept. Does yeah. it turn out the way that you had originally sure. hoped? What happens next? Where do you, you go from there? Well, I, um, I have worked very hard uh, my career and and spending a lot of time focusing on one of my big things is if you say you're going to do something, even if the time comes and you don't want to do it or you're like, oh, this is a bad idea, whatever. And it and someone else is expecting you to do it. You got to still do it anyway, because that is every piece of integrity that you could like that is integrity, right? Everyone likes to include like integrity on their core values or whatever. But integrity really is a virtue. It's not a value. And a virtue means something that you actively do, not just something you believe in. So I like to talk about virtues. Virtues are things that you do, not I just believe in them. I can put every cool poster you want up on your wall, but it doesn't mean anything unless you actually do that. So Integrity is my number one. And why I say that is because um, I've done that for a long time. And because of that, I had a, I wouldn't say a giant list, but I had a list enough of individuals who are successful individuals, way more successful than I am and still are, that are interested in being involved in projects that I have coming up or and I have. And so I, you know, called one of my mentors and people on that list saying, Hey, this is a complete disaster and fire. How am I going to get through this? Number one, which he did help me. And number two, uh, just help me not financially, but literally just like, Oh, well, this is what you're going to do. And this is how you're going to do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so I have a list of individuals who were like, Hey, I want involvement in your next project. So I had an idea and I, there was, there's, through all of those things I just talked about, whether it was the first gym I took over, whether it was uh, the professional athletic space, um, which in that space, what we did was we, uh, they trained even through youth athletes, athletes all the way from youth through the, the collegiate and pro level, and then did off season training specifically in football, like NFL, CFL, that type of stuff. Um, even through that space. And then even through uh, my own concept, my physical brick and mortar gym that I built, we always utilize these formulas that we found that were here made in Tampa. They're a small company and they always worked. So whether it was, you know, a 28 year old professional football player, whether it was a 45 year old, you know, single dad who was just working out, you know, a business guy working out three, four times a week, or whether it was, you know, me, cause I was using the products myself, you know, some, late 20 something who thinks he's a competitive athlete who actually isn't, but just wants to feel like it. Yes. Um, they worked, they worked across, you know, all different modalities. And so there was something really there. And like I said earlier, I'm a, I'm an opportunist. That's all I do. I find things that are opportunistic and I try and take advantage of those opportunities. And so 
I called my mentor after kind of the, the dust was settling and the fire was kind of being put out, at least from my perspective on that previous deal. Um, and I, and I was like, Hey, you want to, you want to get involved in this? Like, I think I can, I think I can get in there, figure out what's up. And there, there might be a deal to be done to acquire this company because yeah. I like to listen for different things that are happening. And if I can taste blood in the water, then there's a deal to be done and I'll, I can figure out a way to make it happen. And that's exactly what we did. Had somebody on the inside. There was some interterm businesses are only for sale for one of two reasons. One wildly successful. You don't have enough cash to grow it, or you're looking for, you know, lump sums of cash. You sell to a VC. They come in, they give you a bunch of dough. They say, okay, get out, you know, yeah. you can move to the passenger seat or get out of the car. The big boys are coming to play and that's fine. That's great. Or they're available for acquisition because they're in trouble. They don't have cash. They, um, they are the ownership or manager, the manager, whatever it is, there's inter turmoil. There's, there's a disaster happening behind the scenes. Yeah. This acquisition was of the, the, the latter yeah. of those two options. Okay. So we went in, um, you know, made an offer and had a deal done within three weeks. And then that was, you know, five years ago. And we've spent basically every waking moment of those five years taking the formulas, cleaning everything up from manufacturing to uh, messaging, to marketing, to making the formulas actual, actually better. We've had one massive hit. We own about 30 different formulas, I would say, but we've had one huge, huge hit that has, you know, kind of caught on like, I wouldn't say wildfire, nothing really does. It's, it feels like it when you're right there, but it's been years of just yeah. cleaning stuff up. And so that's what we did. That's where we're at today. All right, and so what is that company? What is the, what is the, the, the name of the company is called bioprotein technology. Um, we make non-synthetic alternatives to prescription drugs, meaning our big hit is a non-synthetic alternative to human growth hormone. And what it is, it's a, it's a growth factor formula. Growth factors are just cell signals. They're cell signals that are created by the hormone itself, growth hormones. So growth hormone is secreted from the pituitary gland. It's sent to your liver to be converted into what are called growth factors. Those are just cell signals. They get sent out into the blood. They trigger cells to perform an action. So if you're trying to grow muscle tissue or repair muscle tissue in between workouts, it's not testosterone that does that. It's actually IGF-1, which is the direct end result of human growth hormone. The same with metabolic function, elasticity in your skin, even sexual function. That's human growth hormone. That's not necessarily like, I say testosterone because that's the big, everyone's doing this TRT thing and, and that's great, but even more, people don't even know that in order to absorb testosterone, it doesn't matter if it's natural or synthetic, you have to have adequate growth hormone specifically, it's end result growth factors. So what we do is we extract growth factors from another mammal. Uh, we put it into a sublingual formula, meaning it absorbs into the mucosal lining of your mouth. So it goes directly into your bloodstream, avoids the digestive tract as much as we can. And then we're just giving you those growth factors, those cell signals directly to trigger the cellular functions that we want to trigger, you know, muscle gain, repair, wound healing, skin, all kinds of stuff like that, but without ever touching your endocrine system. So we're never manipulating the glandular function of your brain. We're never manipulating hormone levels that way. There's no cycling. So you don't have to like take all kinds of weird drugs to offset the natural suppression of the hormones that you would take when you take a TRT or you take a synthetic HGH you're going to naturally suppress your hormone levels. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. It's cool, but you will incur some sort of a risk or a side effect because of that. So that being said, we focus on the end result, which are growth factors. And realistically, they're just proteins. They're just very specific protein amino acid chains that trigger cells to do stuff. So we can do this safely. We can do it super fast and we can do it in a way that is not invasive, painful, or causes all kinds of weird problems down the line. So ingesting a growth factor or doing it at the inline of that hormonal kind of cascade mm -hmm. that does not have a negative feedback loop. Correct. Negative feedback loop is the exact term you would use. Yes. And so because you're not manipulating the secretion of the hormone and you're not messing with the hormone, you're simply taking protein cytokines. The negative feedback loop, which is suppression of your natural hormone, is incurred when you manipulate glandular function. So you use like a secretagogue, which is very popular these days, also known as a peptide. Again, totally good option. You can use it if you want. Studies aren't really out there for what's gonna happen if not, uh, but you're still manipulating and you're still manipulating the endocrine system. You're still manipulating the glandular function, um, which is secreting more of that hormone. Or you can take the synthetic injection directly, which is the hormone, but it still has to be converted into growth factors. There's, you're not, you can't offset that 
that conversion by the liver into the protein cytokines. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, so how, how are you able to, how are you able to actually get that, um, get that from a, another mammal and make it uh, like bioavailable for like a human. Like the word is, yeah, yeah. So the word is called bioidentical. So they're molecularly identical to what your body already uses. So it's it's not really like, it's again, I'm not an innovator. Like there's no real innovation here. It's it's very similar with testosterone. I mean, they make synthetic or bioidentical testosterone from sweet potatoes, from yeah. yams. They yeah. take, um, this is a very normal process. They take um, thyroid medication from pigs, yeah. right? So we're just taking this and extracting it from mammalian tissue. It's very similar to a PRP process, um, which is plate-rich plasma. You take something out of another, synth, you know, another, area of your body or from a mammal, whatever you want to do, you're distilling it to its, you know, basic form. So you can reintroduce it to the body. That's all that we're doing. Interesting. Very cool. How is it, uh, how is it, how is it you don't require a, a prescription? Good. I would require a prescription for HGH. Sure. Are you required to have a prescription for IGF-1? I would assume. Synthetic IGF-1. So again, a synthetic drug, peptides. So when it's, it's a hundred percent non-synthetic, this is technically OTC. So where we, uh, we're not, we're not allowed to do everything that, you know, other products are allowed to do. There are some sort of regulations, right? We can't, um, we can't utilize a lot of third-party retailers or sellers and stuff like that, which we probably wouldn't anyway. Physicians are the ones who carry their products in the office, sell it to them, their clients. They provide them directly to them. Um, you only really have two ways of getting our product. It's either through us, which we built the platform online to do so, or you have to go to a clinic. Um, you know, they're all over the place at this point. There's national franchises here in the United States that carry this stuff. I mean, if you're in the con actually, if you're anywhere in the United States, uh, maybe Alaska, I don't know. I don't know if we have anybody in Alaska, but Hawaii, yes. Uh, Canada, yes, um, uh, Europe, Asia, all over the place. So it's available. But yeah, you pretty much got to get it through us or you get it through uh, providing physician. Interesting. That is interesting. What are some of the other formulas you'll have? Uh, we do a sleep formula that is... I, I, if you can't, I don't know if people are going to be watching this or not, but if you saw my face light up, I think it... I love... I've been a user of our own stuff for a very long time. That's why I believe in it so much and why I was even willing to acquire the company, right? Anything I'm involved in, I have to have a very specific passion for it. I turn down other projects and other industries to either consult or build on for other companies because like, it's just not worth... I'm not interested. Like, I, I, I gotta... It doesn't matter what it was, but I, I, um, I'm I, not interested. It's not worth my time and I, I don't... It's not how I like to spend and do my life. I told you earlier, I don't want to be a slave and even if it's something I don't want to do. So I, the point is, is that I get real excited about this stuff. The sleep product that we have, that we do provide, but we're going to be doing a large uh, push and roll out for this stuff here in the next, uh, for the remainder of the, in the coming months of this year yeah. is exceptional. So I believe that sleep, forget any product. I mean, we sell stuff, but forget everything. I, all the stuff I just said, getting good sleep is basically using steroids. If you get garbage sleep and your sleep cycles are trash and you have to measure this stuff just because you're unconscious does not mean your sleep is great. You can go drink a bottle of whiskey. You'll be unconscious for a long time. Your sleep is going to be trash. And what I mean by that is you have two specific sleep cycles you should be concerned with. You have slow wave sleep and REM sleep. They're your two deep sleep cycles. And if those sleep cycles are impeded or, um, or interrupted in any way, shape, or form, even more than once a night, you are automatically impacting your natural hormone function. So 70 to 90% of all of your natural hormone secretion is happening during those sleep cycles. For men, it's closer to the 90%. It's mainly testosterone and growth hormone. So all the cool stuff that you want, well, if you're not tracking those sleep cycles, you're in big trouble. So anyway, um, we have a formula that is very easily quantifiable. It's very easily tracked. It works the very first night that you use it. And if you're wearing like a whoop band, what do you got on your arm? You got a whoop band or something? Uh, aura? Garmin, but yeah, I, 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 I okay. Bet. People love I the Garmin. Use, I use an eight sleep to track my sleep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Even better. Eight sleep is very awesome. You're definitely invested into your sleep thing. Cause those are not a joke. Those are very expensive. Yeah. Um, so you, you put your money where your mouth is. I love it. So, um, you can directly measure, uh, your slow wave sleep and your REM sleep and increases, uh, I mean, in the tens and tens of percentages, if not the hundreds of percentages of changes. So if you're, 
a lot of people, I think 78% of Americans are technically like sleep deprived and their sleep cycles and those, you should be spending over an hour. I'm being conservative over an hour in each one of those sleep cycles a night. You'd be surprised. Most people are like 15 to 20 minutes of some of those. Yeah. If you're able to improve that to 90 minutes in each sleep cycle, your entire life will change. Whether you take our product, anything. And what we've been able to do is we can directly track your sleep cycles in the next 72 hours and show increases of, uh, everybody's different, but I mean, we've had increases of over 300% just in the first 72 hours. So it's, it's dramatically changes how people live their lives. That is a very fun one that we do and very excited about it. What is it? I mean, what's in it? It's actually very simple. So it's uh, B6 pyridoxine, which yeah. is, a, is a certain form of B6, vitamin B6, uh, bovine colostrum, which means just colostrum from cows. We use Makuna extract, which is a bean like um, extract. It's an L-dopamine precursor. We do two milligrams per serving of melatonin. Before anybody freaks out, it's totally safe. It's anything over five milligrams per serving you should be concerned about. Um, uh, Shilajit, goji berries, which is lysium and aloe vera extract. And those three things are added at the end because they are used to increase the permeability of the cell wall to, uh, to drive the other um, active ingredients into the, for the body to use it. It'll actually probably increase the other stuff that you take too, but it, um, it doesn't necessarily just knock you out. Like we're not trying to render you unconscious. What we're trying to do is increase the time you spend in those deep sleep cycles. And, uh, I'm very comfortable saying it's, we achieve it. And it's the, the people it doesn't work for are in the, I, I can't even quantify the amount of percentage because we track certain things of like who can play and who doesn't all this fun stuff. It's, I think I, in five years, I've heard three different people who are like, no, it didn't work for me. Yeah. Well, I feel like everyone's sleep is so, so horrendously uh, out of whack that like, like pushing the needles in any direction is, 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 came in, it's very achievable because it's like, it's literally well, bad. Yeah. And the thing with sleep is like, everyone thinks you have to extend the amount of time you're like in bed. And I get that. And that's not necessarily not the case, but if you just extend the amount of time you spend inside of those specific sleep cycles, you don't need 10 to 12 hours. A lesser known fact is that as you age for each decade, you age, the amount of time your body will naturally stay asleep goes down. Yeah. And so the, the importance for improving what's called sleep hygiene, which I know I'm telling you things you already know, uh, improving sleep hygiene, the quality of your sleep, how your body actually sleeps, your own sleep environment becomes um, paramount as a necessity, especially as you have children and your careers and jobs and whatever that is. So if you can just pack in, you know, eight hours of sleep in six, why wouldn't you do that? And that's exactly what we're doing. We're able to pack in eight hours of, you know, sleep into only six. Yeah. I think one of the scariest, um, statistics to me is that poor quality sleep increases your risk of neurodegeneration and a byproduct of neurodegeneration is poor quality sleep so essentially it's like you can it's a never-ending circle thing you can set yourself in an un uh in, in a down suspend that you just can't save yourself from and like yeah, I get it. a lot of people it's like you don't realize it to hit you in your 60s and then you're like sucks because and next to drinking water it's like the easiest thing to fix but there's some for some reason there's always some excuse about why you can't get better sleep and listen i hear you i got a one and a half year old who ain't sleeping i get it but at some level you have to at least try <laughs> you yeah. have to at least try right but like you said it's the uh the yes kids are going to mess up your sleep no doubt about it however if on top of that, you're on your phone um, in bed, 100%. you have a TV in your, in your room, you're doing all these other things, you're drinking too much alcohol at night, you're doing all these other things that are negatively impacting your sleep, you're not exercising, whatever it be. It's like, that's just another compounding factor. So it's like, hey, if the only thing, if everything else is correct, and the only thing I have to deal with is, is a kid who's not sleeping for like, I mean, what seems like forever, but not not an actual forever timeline. Yeah handled it a lot better because yeah maybe you're not that maybe now you're getting 90 percent of your previous 100 you know percent great sleep well yeah it's all so what you're saying i mean i totally i totally agree one of the things that i teach not only to like sales reps or people that work for us or anything or even in like 
fitness. Cause I, you know, I do do a lot of, I'm in the fitness environment. I'm in, we work with athletes and I've done, you know, do shows like this all the time. And a lot of the times it's like, well, what's your best advice? And even with sleep and what you just said is like, just making small little changes. I am against making catastrophically large life changes all at once and thinking you're going to continue on with it because what we call that in, in business is like waiting for Superman. Like Superman's never going to come. And this we use this with sales guys a lot. Like Superman ain't ever going to come and fix your numbers, bro. Like the only thing that's going to come and fix your numbers is small adjustments of completing the work at hand over long periods of time. Fitness, food, it's all exactly the same. It's small increments of like just consistently doing them. So like I get asked the question like, well, you know, what's your number one advice for somebody who wants to embark on a fitness journey and stuff I'm like this? I'm like, don't overthink it. <laughs> don't overthink it. Don't put some massive plan in action. Don't do any of that. You need to, or like, what's your favorite like workout for people just starting? I go, the one that they're going to do. Yeah, because, I like it. Because, because what happens is you get people and they they subscribe to like these, uh, like these 90 minute, two hour workouts that they're going to do twice. And then they're going to feel like crap. And then they're going to, they're going to drop off again. And it's like, okay, well, was that really that effective? No, it wasn't. Why didn't you just do and this is where EMOMs come into play. But why didn't you just do a 20 minute workout three times a week? Because 60 minutes every week consistently over the course of six months is going to blow out of the water the four hours of work you did in one week and never went back to it. So instead of just cutting out and just changing your entire life and like trying to think you're going to like rip the bandaid off magically and it's like you're going to, you know, wake up tomorrow and be. I don't know, you know, uh, uh, running the combine after a week of training is so stupid. It doesn't work and it, it doesn't work for anything in life. You have to, you have to pick and put into place what you can be consistent with. You can be held accountable to, and that you're going to complete. I'm 38 years old and I, yeah, I'm very lucky. I've been in fitness for a long time. I've gotten to work. You know, I used to love training with the football. I've never taken a snap in my entire life, dude, of football, but I used to love training with those guys and trying to stay with them and have them kill me. And it's great. <laughs> one of the things that, one of the things that I did working out with professional, like I thought I was cool. The, the, these people will crush you as a human being. They're not, even, it's not even like they're trying. It's not even really fair. It's really crazy. But anyway, that's why they're professional athletes. This is such a small percentage of human beings that are capable of doing that type of output with is like not caring. It's unreal and a lot of skill and training. But anyway, um, my point being is as I've gotten older, the smartest thing that I ever learned because it was killing me was I actually work out less. So my workouts are at worst 50 minutes. So if my workouts are an hour, they're too long. Yeah. Do I work out six times a week? Yeah, I absolutely try to at worst five, but it's, I can do five because I know my workouts are only going to be 30 to 45 minutes. And I like to think as a 38 year old, a four, you know, basically 40, I like to think I'm in pretty good shape. I yeah. can do some things that, um, you know, my, uh, counterparts or whatever population probably cannot do. And it's not because I'm special. I don't have magical genetics. Um, my dad played football in the seventies, but he was playing when they were ripping cigs on, you know, the sidelines, <laughs> like, <laughs> drinking beers, like, you know, like I don't have some magic bone in my body. I just, I'm consistent. And the, the way that I've stayed with businesses and kids and wife is I shorten those things. Now, all of this rhetoric to get back to the best thing to do business workouts, food is pick things that, you know, you can do consistently that you're going to stick with. That isn't some massive life change. Cause you're not going to do it psychologically. Your brain doesn't even work that way. Um, you have to pick things that are attainable, um, on the short term that lead up to the attainable goals long-term. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, um, I use an analogy called the, the dimmer switch versus the light switch which is like most people, they just flip the light switch on to full bright and turn it off because there's the only two modes they know is on or off, on or off, on or off. Yeah. Like the goal is you got to keep the light on for the, rest of, for the rest of your life. There's going to be periods where you can turn it up. There's going to be periods where you can turn it down. But when you- That's a great analogy. More times, every time you flip it on and then find yourself having to flip it off, you're now finding your identity as the type of person who will turn it off when enough friction comes into your life. Yeah. 100%. versus becoming the person and understand like your idea is like i'm the type of person who will adjust but i'm never going to turn it off i'm always going to keep it on figure out a way to, to, to move through it even if it is just doing 20 minutes i'll do 20 minutes a day and be okay with that then go i'm missing my 90 minute workout so yeah i mean right before i got on uh you know to do this show with you i was three minutes late it's my fault but 
Um, I, I knew that this was going to go later into the, not later into the evening. I mean, it's like four 30 here, but later than, uh, than I would normally do. And I would typically work out probably around like three or 4 PM, something like that. No big deal. But I got a kid and I got a family. So I knew that I needed to get my workout done too. So I just shortened it a little bit. I still got the work done. I still put the reps in. Um, was it as long as I wanted? No, but I got all the movements I needed to do. I got the workout done. I feel really great. It's still accomplished. And because I've adapted those, you know, exactly what it is to reality, which is my reality is no longer lifting for and training and doing all kinds of crazy stuff for two hours. That's not reality. Okay. If I wanted that to be my life, I should have done that starting at 11 years old and played professional sports, <laughs> sports. not, you know, at 25. So, um, but it gets it done and it's done, it's over with, and we continue on and I'll do it again tomorrow. Love it. Why do you think the, uh, why do you think the growth, um, the growth factor, um, product has been the one that's done so well? Because it works. Um, uh, seriously, because it works. And, and, and honestly, it, it, because we, we haven't even able, been able to market the same way as, um, remember we're not a pharmaceutical drug. So pharmaceutical drug companies actually have been able to market more than I have, but it's, um, but we're not like protein powder at GNC. So like, I can't, I can't market the same way that these people have until recently we've cracked a few different codes, but that's neither, you know, I don't want to raise any flags. So that's neither here nor there. But the point is, is like, we haven't actually even been able to market as other people have been able to market. We've had to do this very old school word of mouth. And because the product has worked so well, so fast, um, the word of mouth stuff is is off the charts. So we have a lot of backing from it's in our world, whether it's medical or whether it's, you know, combat sports was a huge vein for us because in certain professional athletics, what we do is not allowed in combat sports. It's a bit of a gray area. It's allowed. It's, eh, it's, it's it might be frowned upon, but it's not, you know, no. explicitly not allowed. Anywho, um, because the product works so well and works relatively fast to its, you know, uh, counterparts like some synthetic treatments and stuff. The um, the word of mouth spread very quickly, and some larger names in those specific industries really had our back. And they're not, you know, they're not exactly paid. Like a lot of these things have happened. We've been able to grow so fast because I haven't had to spend all kinds of money marketing like a lot of people do, especially through influencer campaigns and stuff. Because the product works so good, people do this stuff for free. So it's been. Um, it's been wildly successful for us. And I also to more of the other than just like to toot my own horn while this stuff's great. The other reason is because there hasn't really been a mainstream option to give people outside of just which I say, do this before you do anything, before you buy our stuff, before you get the injections, whatever it is, other than sleep, nutrition, and workouts, there isn't an option for individuals. It's either that and just hope, hopefully that that works, or I got to go get on a needle that I got to be on forever. Yeah. Um, there hasn't been really a middle ground and we give people the option of, Hey, you need to do these things anyway, but if you're not ready to take the needle or you're not a candidate, because this is another thing, you're not necessarily a candidate for these treatments, or you don't want to be, you don't want to be rendered infertile because you're a younger guy. Cause that happens very common. Um, we give you a stepping stone to that. I'm not saying I'm against the medical treatments. I'm not saying I'm for them. I'm saying I'm for them when they are medically necessary and they make sense. I don't think that they, like any of this, including us, should not be the first go. I believe in food, nutrition, and working out. But other than those options, there wasn't something that was a safer option to me other yeah. than, you know, jumping right to the injection, not to mention the FDA jumped in in November of 2023 and banned my number one competition really. So <laughs> that helped out exponentially. <laughs> that has been a completely different environment. It's kind of been, you know, how fast can we get this stuff made and in front of the right people? What were some of the, um, what are some of the results or, in, or effects that people could you know expect to, to feel from the IGF, um, Sure. So some of the results you can expect is physicians all the time send in their blood work. So we work with doctors all over the place and they'll show increases in uh, IGF-1 specifically because that's the growth factor that's tracked. By the way, if you're getting blood work done, you want to do it. You're going to have to ask for that specifically because it's not something that's included on basic blood panels any longer. That's a whole nother conversation of growth hormone and IGF-1 and stuff like that. It's not bad. They just don't include it anymore. Um, but uh, so we see blood panels is something we see all the time. 
And that's, you know, people who do their blood work 30 to 90 days, but from what they're feeling is 10 to 14 days without question, without question all the time. It's always the same story. 10 to 14 days. I feel like a massive energy boost. There's plenty of reasons behind that. There's lots of science behind growth factors and why those things might be occurring. That's typically it. If someone, especially men are having some sort of a sexual dysfunction, like when you were a young guy, you woke up with, you know, aroused. That was a norm because your sexual function is working appropriately. Um, as you age for some guys that disappears. Well, typically if that's an issue for older guys, um, with our product within the first like 48 to 72 hours, they start to see that come back. And that's a very big, like aha moment for them. And that's uh, I remember one pro fighter, and this is a, a real pro fighter who does not promote our product. He does not get paid. He buys it like everybody else. He doesn't want to promote it. We can't probably afford him either way. He's like, man, all this stuff sounds so great. But when I took the product and I woke up like that two days in, I was like, I'm sold. I'm a lifer. Forever. <laughs> so like, I don't pay that guy. Like, um, anyway, so that's, that's the kind of power the product has had. And that's, it's really, uh, caused us to kind of catapult. So the, the physical changes, we got phenomenal results from that before and afters, but that type of change, just like, I'm sure you know, this, even you could take the most hardcore drug on the planet. It's still going to take four to six weeks for your body to actually burn fat cells to to because what you're doing with our product is you're you're triggering cellular multiplication and differentiation meaning the, the the creation of new cells that takes time so physiological changes like muscle tissue and fat loss and stuff it it takes you know four to six weeks at the fastest amount but um yeah stuff like that <laughs> as someone who's been training for two and a half decades like Four six weeks sounds amazing. <laughs> I know, I know, and and, and so that that's one cycle of a uh, one training block. <laughs> you know, I hear you. But if it's done right, you should absolutely see some sort of results in four to six weeks from that. You know, that training block. Whether even if it's, you know, even if it's a reduction of inflammation or subcutaneous water storage because your body's now processing and getting through things appropriately. I mean, you'll see. You'll, I'm sure you see great results in four to six weeks. Even it might not be ideal. You're not going to walk out on stage at four to six weeks with anything, but. Uh, I'm sure it's headed in the right direction. Any or thoughts, any issues behind um, taking it along with TRT? 100%. We actually encourage that if you're on TRT. It's it's a great companion product because again, uh, 20, 30 years ago, I keep saying like 20 in some of these things, but I, I forget how old I am. It's like, this has been a long time, but like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when before TRT, I'm talking like the nineties, early two thousands and stuff before TRT became this like huge thing. And, and again, I'm in Florida. So you have like, you know, McDonald's, Starbucks, yeah. TRT clinic, all cash pay. You can get lunch, you can get your coffee and you can get your injections within 90 minutes of time. And you're spending most of your time at McDonald's and Starbucks waiting for your coffee, not the injections. <laughs> um, anyway, before this whole like thing, it was very common for and typical for you to get a growth hormone treatment with your testosterone treatment. So you got growth and your test. However, things change in the medical space uh, with the blink of an eye. And there's different organizations that run how certain prescriptions can be prescribed. More importantly, what they can be prescribed for. So there was a change that occurred. Now, this is a complete personal opinion and I have no problem. I, I Most of my job used to be traveling and educating doctors on stuff, exactly what I'm about to tell you and their opinions, but there, no one dis, you know, disagrees yeah. with this. Disagrees with this. The, yeah. the growth hormone is a great phenomenal drug for what it was originally created for. And that was human growth hormone deficiency syndrome. It was created in 1968. They used to suck it out of dead bodies. And then they you know, figured out a way to actually make it from recumbent DNA, but it's designed to help children who do not make growth hormone. So they cannot grow, right? It's a sense of dwarfism. So anyway, they would give this drug to children who were not making it so they could live somewhat of a normal life, right? They didn't have to live as a, you know, I mean, that's an awful existence. It's not even cool. So great drug. However, it's got great benefits for growth hormone deficiency as you age, right? Hormonal decline. I'm not saying it's bad for that. What I'm saying is, is it gets, what happens is a drug gets created for one instance, then gets started to be used for a different instance. A lot of times that leads to some level of abuse or the prescribing or of abuse by physicians prescribing a drug that it's not approved for. That's called off-label use, which happens for a certain amount of period of time. And eventually some things happen, people get involved, bad things happen. And the FDA or other medical boards get involved and go, Hey guys, 
you're not allowed to do that anymore. Anyway, so slowly growth hormone became extremely highly regulated, started to disappear. Uh, the cost to get it, you can still get it the same. You can still get it prescribed for aesthetic stuff, depending upon where you are at in the country, in the world, whatever. But a normal growth hormone treatment outside of Florida anyway, is going to be around three to $10,000 a month. So as these things increase, I don't know how, I don't know how many people, you know, that are going to afford $10,000 a month for just one, you know, hormone treatment. That's a ton of cash. Not saying that the people don't exist. I'm saying it's not exactly a huge market, which also will tell you why IGF one, which is the biomarker, how you test for growth hormone started to drop off of blood panels. Nowadays, doctors don't even really know about it, right? They don't even, oh, I don't include that in my blood panels. I'm not looking for it. Well, nope. So now we're all the way forward. Why I said all of this is because remember, the science is clear. It's not my science. It's settled science. The it's, and you can go, you can Google the science behind it. You cannot absorb testosterone effectively, whether it's synthetic or natural without adequate IGF-1, the direct end result of growth hormone treatments, which is why they were involved together or prescribed together years ago. They are symbiotic elements. They're symbiotic hormones together. They have to be paralleled, which is why, and this is something people don't really ever think about or think exists. You can take TRT injections. It doesn't mean your body is going to absorb it or utilize it the way you think it's going to. There are patients that do not respond. That is a normal thing. So when you add in other products, you can actually get your testosterone numbers up. When you add in growth factors, you can get those TRT numbers up without necessarily adding more of the actual testosterone drug. Or what people like to do is think, okay, well, maybe I can teeter off how many milligrams I have to take per week because my body can utilize what I'm taking more so I don't have to take as much. That's up to your physician. So we do that with physicians. That's why our product does so well in clinics and TRT clinics. We're not trying to take people off of TRT. We're not trying to stop them from it. They do work hand in hand. It's just an additional option to answer your question as you've given me seven minutes to run my mouth about it. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's a great companion. Yes. How does it, how does it help the absorb? I mean, is it, um, is it the, is it the uptake of the testosterone to the to the receptor side? Like what, where, where, how does it help? So and you're gonna I'm gonna be getting outside of my my expertise here. I'm happy to refer you to any one of our physicians, but the way the from my understanding and the way that it helps is you have to have the actual cell signals to create the actual change. So if you're if you do not have the cell signals to create the change to basically um, not piggyback the process, but to promote the process and to work too well together. It's, it's just not going to work as effectively as it could. So you, you need the, the testosterone to bind to the receptor site, but maybe you then also need the growth factor to trigger protein sensitive cellular change creation. It would require more than one hormonal signal. So you can't just have it. Well, yeah. And it's not just testosterone, right? This is actually um, the same similarly with estrogen as well, right? They, they need it. There's a, there's a delicate balance and I, I don't like the term hormonal balance, but this is where that kind of term type kind of stems from is you, you have to have the levels in balance with each other, whether that's cortisol or testosterone, because they affect how the body releases those hormones and utilizes those hormones, whether it's insulin, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, they all, again, I don't like when there's like hormonal balance, like, but this is where that term comes into play is they balance each other out. One is being used at a certain amount of time. One's being used at a different amount of time. They have to be used in conjunction with each other to affect the optimal benefits specifically with anabolism. But yes, um, that's where like kind of that terminology and them working together kind of comes into play. Is there any concerns? I, I recall my concerns around taking IGF-1. Now this is synthetic IGF-1 and cancer. Uh, sure. Creating, you know, the sure. proliferation of these cancer cells. Is there, con is there concerns there or how would you guide someone that, who maybe? So I'm going to play both sides. Yeah. Because that's exactly where the science lies, especially if you talk to physicians, somebody's going to be on one entire side and somebody's going to be on the other, or there's going to be a guy in the middle, but the guy in the middle is irrelevant for the sake of this conversation. Some people are going to be like, Hey, stay away from it. Some people are going to say not stay away from it. There's studies that show now this is to correlate two different things together, but there's studies to show that the, there's higher PSA levels, prostate specific antigens, like prostate cancer in individuals who have a lower IGF one score. Okay. So there's kind of a Goldilocks zone yeah. opinion. 
there's kind of a Goldilocks zone, right? Of um, cause you can say similar things about testosterone where testosterone through the roof. Well, then there's problems with this. And then if it's too low, then we can correlate it to this, right? There's Goldilocks zones for these types of things. Um, the, the, the too low of IGF one, which is again, how you measure growth hormone can be tied to all kinds of different diseases and disorders. A lot of them neurological diabetes are uh, Parkinson's ALS, MLS, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but yes, when you're taking a synthetic drug, IGF one, whether it's growth hormone or IGF one directly, there are studies to directly relate. I think there's one study that people reference all the time. It's a breast cancer study. And they, there's some things that should be noted about that study, which is first and foremost, it's a synthetic drug. The second one is that they're, they are giving these people, if you actually read the study, other than just the headline, the amount of drug and the synthetic amount of IGF one that they're giving them is off the charts. Yeah. Okay. It's not even, it's not even considered a nor not even close to a normal level. It's off the charts. Right. So those two things needed to be taken into consideration when you're going to, when you're going to quote the study, because we do get that a lot, a lot less these days. In the earlier days, we used to get that all the time. And I would always tell people back when I had to run expos and go face to face with doctors or like you're doing with me right now, I'd have to do like speed rounds. And I was like, you send me the study. Here's my email. Here's my phone number. You send me the study that shows that any type of any type of information that will show non-synthetic growth factor use could show any type of study. I have yet to see one. I've yet to have a, a sales rep provide one that from because I tell them to do the same thing. Um, now with the how popular peptides are, it's hardly ever even talked about because people are going off on a complete other world of tangents of off-label use with that kind of stuff. So I'm the least concerned for everybody now, which is great. Again, a lot of people have done my job for me, but. Um, yeah, the study is only on non or excuse me, the study is only on synthetic drug use and at extreme rates. What I would say is um a cancer discussion with your physician should all if you're really concerned about it, that should be a discussion with you and a specialist or somebody that understands this stuff or you're going to monitor it. We have you know no studies that have come back or any type of adverse events that we've had to report because we do have to register with the FDA. We have to do all this crazy stuff and those things get tracked. And um, not since I've ever owned the company, have we ever had any type of adverse event or type of issue we've had to deal with in that respect. Awesome. Very cool. And just to, to for the listeners who may not be, know what Goldilocks zone means, can you explain that to someone? It's not too hot, not too cold. It's, you know, so you have any time you're going to get any type of blood work done, whether it's IGF-1, because I've been running my mouth with it about it for an hour and 15 minutes, or it's going to be, um, you know, testosterone, whatever. It's it's a numerical scale. So depending upon, and this is where, this is a whole other conversation, but the scale is always changing. But anyway, where you're, it depends where you're at in the country, where you're at in the world, of where your number should be, depending upon what age Hormones have different numerical numbers that they quantify what your levels are at, okay? Too low, you need some sort of a medical intervention. Too high, which is typically never the case for somebody on a natural thing. They're only really worried about too high when it's a synthetic drug is involved. Too high can put you into what's called an abnormal zone, which is where people incur uh, certain levels of side effects, cardiac issues, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, infertility is actually at every rate, which is something people I think need to know about because a lot of young guys get on TRT and then they realize they can't ever have kids and it's tragic. So that's not in an abnormal zone. That's normal um, for the use of the drug. Then, um, but anyway, yeah. So when you get to the abnormal zone, even whether it's growth hormone, whether it's testosterone, you're looking at incurring uh, extreme potential for side effect for catastrophic event. Awesome. So we want Goldilocks zone. We want in the middle. We want healthy in the middle. You know, I'm not worried because I'm too low. I'm not worried because I'm too high. I feel great. I look great. I'm in a safe zone. I'm not burning my tongue on the porridge and my porridge isn't too cold that I'm spitting it out. There you go. Love it. Awesome. Dustin, man, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Can you let people know um, your website, where they can learn more, all that stuff? Sure. Um, I always recommend people if they want to check us out, go to our social media stuff. Uh, we have a large Instagram following and why I say that is you're going to see people that actually use the product. We highlight real individuals. It's not a bunch of rhetoric and crazy hard sales pitches. It's just material that we generate that's been gotten us this far. And it's, it's a good environment to be a part of. So come join us on that team. It's uh bioprotein tech. So at symbol B I O P R O T E I N T E C H. 
And if you want to check us out on the website, get some more information, look at frequently asked questions, get connected with a doctor. If you want to do that, you can go to the website at www.bioproteintech.com, B-I-O-P-R-O-T-E-I-N-T-E-C-H.com. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Dustin. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to NBS Fitness Radio. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to share it with your friends, follow us on social media, and check out our website at www.nbsfitness.net. Hit the subscribe button and tune in next time for more NBS Fitness Radio.